Thank you for your presentation. Uh, you. Great input, in fact, with, for the, the discussions we need to, to have, I think, at international level. I was wondering, um, regarding that, that last point, that um, I was surprised on the fact that uh, in the external restriction, uh, it wasn't taking into account the, f the financial burden of, uh, of external, external debt, which I think it's, uh, for instance, I, I, I was also surprised in the map, you could see the United States, I, I'm Francisco from Argentina, by the way, that Argentina had the same, was in the same group that the United States, as a non-vulnerable uh, country, which might uh, seem uh, reasonable from a point of view of, of the level of development, but right now, it's, uh, there's a, a big, um, important renegotiation with the IMF. And you can see that the government is pushing really hard some, some projects on, on fusil oils and mining and the, the kind of projects that we wouldn't want uh, to, at least uh, it would only make us uh, deeper into trouble in the, in the future. So um, maybe there's a reason why you didn't take into account the, ex the, the financial aspect of the balance of payment, uh, but I think it, it, it's quite important considering also the you know, like neoliberalization, and, uh, neoliberal neoliberalism, globalization, financialization, and the, and the fact that the external restriction is increasingly financial, a financial problem. Um, hi, um, so um, I'm Maria and I'm from Pakistan and I would, because we also had this discussion during our other classes when you had classes with uh, Major B and I think um, the most important question for me when it comes to the exposure to the low carbon transition is the fact of circular debt crisis and I don't know because the concept itself is really complicated and it also takes me every time a while to understand because the thing is that it's basically uh, the shortfall of payments at the central pur uh, power purchasing agency. And when, these, when this agency is not able to receive the outstanding payment from the distribution companies, and due to the shortfall in the receivables, which are basically by the state-owned distribution companies and the privatized electric companies. And considering that uh, most of the electricity generation within Pakistan um, is because of the six, um, I mean, it, the it dependency is 60 to 70 percent from the oil and gas that is imported. And the fact that this tends to create this um, short, uh, shortage within the uh, fuel suppliers, like within the country, and the fact that due to the delay in the payments from the government, it's, it's not able to make payment to these fuel suppliers. So in the end, what happens is that all of this is translated and also like the IMF suggestion as part of the austerity, the austerity policies as part of the loans. It then goes on to the consumers because it is translated into the high power tariffs. And in the end, it then adds to all the socioeconomic exposure, which is like high poverty and the fact that there's a uh, depression in incomes as well. And I see that as of, um, you know, the whole economy which is working through the notion of circular debt because this is also like part of the revenue generation from the government because most of the uh, revenue that is collected is through uh, these power tariffs. And then the whole circular chain that goes because of the circular debt that is as a part also like part of revenue generation for the government but from the socioeconomic perspective it's also like a big time cost that is imposed on uh, the population as a whole. <laughs> and um, as the demand for electricity is increasing, so is the circular debt. Like I was just going through the figures and right now, the circular debt has been rising by 0 0.17 uh, euros, um, 0 0.17 billion euros per month. And it has been since the past five months. So it has been increasing and escalating month by month. So I just wanted to ask like, and what do you, how do you see that in perspective and in line with the low carbon transition, especially when you know that being a developing country, it's so much dependent and there's a whole uh, paradigm that is going on behind that from the government aspect and also from the socioeconomic exposure aspect. Mm -hmm. Last question. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, thank you very much for the questions and the discussion. Um, we were just kind of also want to address what are the implications of the methodology which was developed in terms of future case studies or future also like understandings of policy mechanisms which are possible with this vulnerability discussion. So maybe we were talking about the European border, uh, carbon border adjustment uh, mechanism, but if we're talking in terms of a global tax uh, on carbon, that would also be something that we can analyze with the, um, with the measurement that we are using, and if so, it, what are the mechanisms that this can be integrated within the analysis. And then another comment which has much to do more with policy, and that's the, the um, point that Eloisa brought um, to the table. In a sense, it's something that for me, it doesn't really make much sense uh, if we have the discussion on who is exposed to the, to, the to the ecological transition risks without talking who is actually going to finance it. So I'm, I'm very grateful that she brought these issues uh, to the table. And when talking about South-South uh, cooperation or development banks in general, I'm not entirely sure how um, can we integrate uh, vulnerabilities for the ecological transitions in terms of the pricing of loans, for instance. So, like, I is it via ESG? Like, if, if we talk about in terms of environmental governance, yeah, then definitely this can be done. But how to do this without making, like, without breaking away from the international uh, financial structure itself? Because if there's a uh, development bank which says that they will provide better uh, credit ratings for countries which are more fragile, then they actually hurt in their own businesses. So, for me, it's, it's kind of like a very... Um, a problem which has no such a single way out. So for me, it's like either it's in, as Eloisa said, it's a like a cooperation on a global level, as as we can see it from the global uh, tax on, on on carbon. But in a sense, it like we cannot take just one development bank or one or two banks doing this alone. So maybe as a question, like how to effectively ask the question of who is going to finance this transition? Is it what can we learn from the from the methodology and the study in, in those terms? Well, how many minutes I have? Three minutes. Okay. <laughs> I would try to be very... <laughs> no, but uh, I think more than like making, asking, uh, making questions, like you are like just... It, it, actually, you already give the, the, most of the response for your questions. Basically, the thing with the fiscal aspects, like uh, fi financial aspects uh, of the balance of payment. We're not considering here, but uh, we would love to, <laughs> basically. <laughs> Uh, the thing is, like, it's very, very, mm, like, uh, the fine. Uh, we have for the aggregated fin uh, finance balance of payments, like, but we don't don't have it sectorally. Maybe IDE, we uh, FDI, we have like more sectorally uh, uh, sectoral data. But for specific countries, for example, in the case of South Africa, that's uh, one country that we're analyzing, we have these. And we have all the, actually we have like all the financial data sectorally, which is like insanely good for doing a study specifically for South Africa. Uh, but in general, we don't have this. Uh, especially in the case of Argentina, we don't have at all, <laughs> you know this. Uh, and, but of course, like uh, I'm not saying that US and, and Argentina are in the, in the same situation. They have the same exposure because they depend on the same sectors. Actually, when you're looking at the specific uh, uh, sectors that we're talking about, like Argentina, uh, actually, it's not included meat here. And uh, when you're including meat, Argentina goes a little bit like, uh, because it depends a lot on the exports of meat, but, uh, and especially production of meat, uh, generate employment and everything. But uh, when you're looking at the products, Argentina changed a little bit when, when the US, but even if the, it doesn't happen, the thing is, like, uh, okay, the difference between Argentina and the U.S. is basically because the U.S., they have all the cap not all, uh, Germany has all, but uh, uh, the U.S. has much of many capabilities to produce these green products, and Argentina doesn't. Argentina is a country that uh, they depend on these industries, and they are stuck in, the, in these industries. Like, they, they cannot move easily to the, from these industries to a more complex industry. Okay, it's, if you look at this data, for example, in complexity, it's much better than uh, other countries, but still, it's not like uh, it's not like the U.S. So, uh, trying to answer these two questions, <laughs> uh, basically, the paper is one approach, but it can go further beyond these, looking at the financial aspects. For if you have data, but if we have it for specific countries. And uh, it's something that we try to do with the green complex indices is looking at going further, going beyond the exposure and looking, okay, exposure is something 
But you have to look at the country specificities to analyze the vulnerability and risks because like, uh, you cannot say that Argentina and the US are in the same situation even though they are in the same situation in terms of exposure or close, not exactly the same. About the, uh, the circular debt, I, I don't know exactly how it works to try to explain, but uh, we have to look more deeply in these. But it's a, it's a very interesting because, like, basically, uh, like going through this paper and looking a little bit on what we can do with this paper in the case of uh, counters that import oil to produce electricity is basically the thing that we we're discussing before. Like, uh, if you're going to the product and say, okay, the power plants in uh, in these countries, like. Uh, I don't know, besides, uh, yeah, you have many other countries that uh, import oil and produce electricity for, uh, or coal. They import coal and produce electricity uh, from coal. Uh, basically, these power plants are given. They have to deal with these because they are there. They will not export the power plant. They, they produce and they like take years for uh, depreciate, like uh, 30 years, like 40 years. Like it will be there and they will produce, they will have these stranded assets, like uh, stranded assets, basically these assets that we we'll lose, you have uh, economic depreciation, which is completely different from the, uh, the physical depreciation, because you theoretically, like uh, when you're moving from these in, this type of electricity to uh, green electricity, these assets will be losing importance. And then I think the it will impact even more the, the debt because like basically these firms are financed by the governments in general and the gov they will not be, pay, be able to pay these governments. And about the, again about the financial aspects and the interrelation and again and a little bit on the who is financing, uh, we are working on some, uh, in a matrices where we have all count, uh, the debt of each country in relation to the other country so you have like a, all countries here and all countries. So the debt of each country depends on the, uh, which, which countries finance the debt of each country. And maybe with these, we can start thinking about these uh, financial risks for other countries. Because like, uh, if a country that is very vulnerable and will face a lot of problems with the fa uh, to a transition, is facing problems like these stranded assets, like basically the, the stranded assets, basically the, the countries that finance this country will be also facing the, a lot of financial problems. So you have like, a, in the same way that you have a intersectoral interrelation, we have an inter-country interrelation that uh, uh, indirectly there are many other aspects that we have like to look at. So. Uh, and finally, on the global tax, basically the uh, the global tax, it's I, I don't know, it's my personal sorry, my personal opinion, but um, uh, most of the pressure that the CBAM, for example, is making is to for the other countries to adopt also uh, carbon taxation, because basically what the CBAM is doing is to uh, uh, one of the results of the CBAM is like. If the country, for example, Korea, they have a carbon uh, adjustment, they have a carbon market, like for, they, they charge uh, products in terms of the carbon emission, uh, Europe is not charging the country. So basically they are, they are uh, stimulating countries to adopt these type of mechanisms. So it's a kind of like uh, pressure for these. Uh, and of course, if Japan, Korea, the US, the UK, the FTA countries, they adopt this, uh, this CBAN or something similar as the CBAN too. Or the, uh, what happens is that there is a very big pressure for the other countries to, to do this. Because basically you are deciding if the money that you are, uh, the revenue from the, ca the carbon revenue will be in the European countries or it will be with your country itself. So it's like, you're just deciding who is charging, you or the others. So it's basically putting a pressure on you to have this. So yeah, and then, uh, sorry, <laughs> the idea of the paper is exactly to look at these and to look at these specificities, uh, having a tool to look at these specificities and to use this, like, okay, you have a carbon uh, general carbon tax, what are the sectors that will be more impacted? Uh, there will be a uh, pressure for substituting fossil fuel electric electricity to uh, uh, photovoltaic electric electricity, then 
countries that export fo fossil fuels, countries that depend on fossil fuels to generate employment and pay wages, they will be more impacted. That's the thing. And they will, if they can change easily to this photo, uh, photovoltaic energy, they will be less impacted because they, they are less vulnerable and they are, uh, even though they are, this position is the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Sorry. Professor. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.